out of your computing environment, too often organizations just assume and buy new. Well, if you can track and anticipate when someone is going to leave or when a update is coming out, you can take the software that you've already got and use it for another purpose. Use it for the new person instead of just assuming that you're going to buy new. And then thirdly is the software asset management tools, things like Flexera, um, Certero, uh, ServiceNow, um, HPAM, although it's not called HPAM anymore, it's now UVU, UVU, whatever. Um, they're all out there, but the point of them is, is that they all do basically the same thing. They pay attention to the software license rules and make sure that you as an organization are following the rules that you've subscribed to. Otherwise, Microsoft and Oracle and Adobe and all of those big software publishers come in and sue you. Not exactly sue, but it's uh, known as a software audit. Now, the prediction is that by 2019, remember those days? Can we call them pre-COVID? That they would expect that software uh, expenditure should decrease by 30%. So, and uh, if anybody wants a, I promised you DuckTales, um, just remember the uh, acronym RUU for RUI, RUI, and RUI to remember recycle software license, optimize software configurations, and use SAM tools. Okay, so my 12-year-old thought that was a great joke. Now, <clears throat> another statistic, 84% of organizations are reporting that they're not seeing anything from their ITAM program. So you've got Gartner saying you should see a 30% reduction, and then over 80% of the people that should see it are saying, we ain't seeing nothing. And this number actually comes from the global survey of 2021 from Deloitte. And if any of you have read through this document, it is very, very telling. Um, but the points that I really do want to make is that six out of 10 of their respondents um, have yet to make asset management self-funding from the money that they are able to generate by interrupting net new purchases instead of re uh, in favor of recycling software and avoiding software audits. Nearly half of those have yet to acknowledge that they are likely to achieve this objective in the next two years. So we've got a problem. And sometimes a problem means an opportunity. So why, though, do SAM programs keep failing? Well, there's two things that I want you guys to consider. Uh, one of them is known as the double spend conundrum. Now, for anyone that is familiar with blockchain, oh, these things are a little off here. Okay. Let me reset real quick. <clears throat> Part of the reason why hardware seems easy is because it follows our innate sense of commerce. This person over here has money and a need. This person over here has a good or service to solve that need. Money goes over to here, goods and services go back over there. End of story. Nine tenths of the law is possession? Exactly. But does that necessarily mean it's foolproof? Absolutely not. Anybody ever hear of the penny slug gag? Take the penny, attach it to a string, drop it in the slot. With a quick jerk of the wrist, hilarity ensues. Software has this same problem. Because it can be infinitely copied and uh, those copies are all stable and useful, you have what you call a double spend conundrum. You can buy it once and then use it through the rest of your organization. Now, in SAM, in my line of work, this software piracy. Blockchain folks know it as the double spend. 
how do you stop people when they say we have taken this cryptocurrency and moved it over there for exchange of goods back over here that that's actually happening? Well, just keep that in mind. Now, software publishers go to great lengths to try to stop software piracy by enacting logins and license keys and all of these other rigmarole in order to stop this. But then they will around and offer a software license agreement to help speed up the process of deploying software into your environment, where they give you one master key that will unlock blank and everything, or they be like Oracle and they just give it to you. And, but it's up to you to not deploy more than you think you should have. Why would they do this? Why would a software publisher act both try to protect their IP at the same time making it difficult to use their intellectual property. Well, that actually comes up with an idea that I like to call the three-headed monster. What's really going on is that there are three parties into any corporate software transaction and everybody has their own agenda. We've got our software publishers that are creating we have the corporate customers, which are buying the tools in order to do their work and generate money. And then we have the corporate end users who are actually using the tools to generate new things, new services, new goods for the benefit of the corporation. SAM tools typically only focus on the relationship between the publishers and the corporate customers. And I think this is a mistake. And if anybody is old enough to remember BlackBerry, when BlackBerry was the only thing you could use in your corporate environment, and then Steve Jobs shows up with the iPhone. How many people in corporate America said, I don't want a BlackBerry anymore, I'm bringing my Apple. And IT departments freaked out. There's a reason for that. And I'll go into that here in a little bit. But let's talk about our software publishers. And good old Gyro Gearloose. I always liked him. He never really got a lot of attention, but I always liked him. So the software publishers have their own goal. They want to make money on their intellectual property. They are generating tools that we use, that we love, that we live by. We can't think of modern life without them. I'm using Microsoft PowerPoint as an example. Again, the 12 year old thought that was hilarious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, so, but they have an expectation of the market. They want to maximize revenue and sell this IP to their corporate customers, and they're going to do it in, uh, in the face of competition. There's always somebody with some other product that they want to sell to the corporate customers as well. But at the same time, end users are also in the mix. That BlackBerry to iPhone example, a lot of revenue is being generated by selling directly to end users. Has anybody seen the ServiceNow Willy Wonka commercials on the Super Bowl? Why are they marketing a service management tool, a ticketing system for a help desk at the Super Bowl? Because they know you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> and they're trying to upsell from the bottom up the people that work at help desks. Hey, let's be like Willy Wonka and buy this tool and then force that up from the bottom into the corporate culture. But now software publishers do have an issue. There's a risk here. If they take too many steps and make it too difficult to use their software, by way of trying to protect their intellectual property, people are going to go away and they're going to lose revenue. So how do you thread that needle? Well, very carefully. You either um, set up programs like license servers that 
you can store license keys on, you give license keys, or you give training on don't be a software pirate and uh, join the Software Business Alliance. Yes, it's still a thing. Um, but the result is, is that you've got the software publishers are setting up this environment where nobody trusts. Corporate customers are trying to use more of their intellectual property than they paid for, and the end users are trying to circumvent whatever processes you have to protect your intellectual property. So what does one do? Well, software auditors end up doing an audit. Stop everything you're doing, give us all of your uh, records of software use from SharePoint to uh, Active Directory to uh, Microsoft MEM, Jamf, whatever you want to call it, and we're going to tell you whether or not you owe us money. Now, let's talk about the second head, the corporate customer. What are they really looking for? Well, they've got one goal, better, faster, cheaper internet uh, IT services. And I hear by the uh, uh, audience, I'm probably going little bit long so let me uh, catch up here a little bit corporate customers know that software is ephemeral and it's going to be changing and there's going to be a new iteration every couple of months they're also expecting the cost to continue the increase which is exactly the opposite of the, what they want done because IT is still a cost sink you put money into it you don't get anything out of it if you don't believe me, there's 84% of that uh, state. Deloitte says exactly that. Now, they also don't trust their end users because the end users are end users. And we all know that joke about end users. And if you don't know that joke, then I'll tell it to you later after a couple, after the networking happy hour. They're trying to do their work. They're going to try to actively circumvent whatever you've got in the way, regardless if it's for their benefit or not, in order to get their work done. So what ends up happening? Well, they know the goods and services are going to increase, but they can't do anything about it. And the end users are going to be human and make mistakes or do something on purpose and cause more problems. So let's now talk about the third headed of the monster. Corporate end users. We all know them, we all love them because we are them. Their goal is really to work smarter, not harder. And that is one of my favorite quotes from DuckTales. They're using the intellectual property of the software publishers to do more with less. They're trying to get their job done as soon as possible with the uh, least amount of effort and so they can get paid. And corporate customers then need to provide those tools. I want Visual Basic. I want JavaScript. I want the latest and greatest of this tool so that I can make the latest and greatest thing work great for the corporation. They really do have the best interest, if you, if you think about it. But don't tell me that I can't do something. Software, public, uh, software programmers are notoriously smart people and know how to work out of a box. And I'm hearing some snickers, so I know that joke is starting to land. <laughs> if you're going to put up a roadblock, they're going to find a way around it because they want to get the job done. So the end result is you've got end users that are actively going, working around the controls that corporate clients and software publishers are putting in place in order to protect their own interests and in intellectual property. So what do you do when you've got all of these three concerns battling it out? Well, here's where I think blockchain comes in. If software asset management leveraged a blockchain solution, one of the features of blockchain is smart contracts, where um, the instructions inside the legal agreement are automated so that transactions can happen fluidly and automatically. 
Software license agreements are contracts, business contracts, pure and simple. You do this, you do that, end of story. This party is responsible for actions A, B, and C. The other party will do X, Y, Z. Everybody's happy. Now, one of the other features of blockchain is, ah, the distributed ledger. Now, the distributed ledger is really that everybody that is participating in the transaction sees the details of the transaction without duplicating the effort of moving data back and forth. And this is done uh, through a very particular cryptology uh, to make it secure and you can also set it up in such a way that only the details that each party really needs are viewable to other parties which is good for not only just cybersecurity, but the real point is that um, the distributed ledger is supposed to give everyone confidence. Whoever has a piece of software and exchanges it for some other piece of software or goods and services, you know that that transaction is actually happening and legit. They have that software, they own that software outright, or the use rights to that software outright and they have legitimately given up those rights to the other person. It's to foster trust. Now the third piece that I really like about blockchain is the immutable records. Since the block is encrypted and is continually encrypted as new uh, entries are added to the blockchain, it's really difficult to go in and post date a transaction to cover your backside. That means then that from a audit point of view, the blockchain is a foundational document. Nobody can cheat, nobody can backfill, nobody can make themselves look better than they really are. That again means fostering trust between those parties. There we go. So, is there any to doing something like this? Well, some people would say it's maybe something like crypto, and I don't think so. Um, crypto, Bitcoin, what have you, I think is what we're is a little too deep because we're not talking about things with real monetary value or an assumed value, but. Non-fungible tokens is actually probably closer to the concept. These are legal rights to use a software within particular rules, not necessarily value in and of itself. So where's the benefit? If we already know what the problems are, is there any value in shaking up the joint? It's working okay, or as maybe okay for these three parties um, at the moment. Can we improve it? What's the incentive for improving? Well, let me drop this little nugget on you. Unfortunately, it's difficult to prove this number because of uh, uh, um, contracts and agreements and non-disclosure agreements that go on between all the parties involved in software audits. But it is generally assumed that around 40% of a software publisher's uh, sales revenue is made up by software audits. Going in, finding their corporate customers, and squeezing them for more sales. Either penalizing them outright, or upselling them to another software, uh, title, or service. That's a lot of money. But if that money is, it, let me put it this way, that money's expensive. Because what you end up having to do when you run a audit is you have to bring in the big four, KPMG, 
Deloitte, Ernst & Young, PwC, and they're going to take their cut to run a software audit on one of your customers and their transactions. So that 40% is not straight up sales revenue. It's 30 cents on the dollar, 25 cents on the dollar. So that's the money that we can actually see. That's the opportunity that if somebody could come in and give a blockchain solution, rebuild trust between the three-handed monsters, show that the um, double spend conundrum is answered, everybody benefits. The users get the software tools that they need fast and efficiently. The corporate customers don't have to worry about getting audited and defending their themselves against uh, presumed malfeasance. And the software publishers get to defend their um, intellectual property. So enter Neocore, uh, which is the first to the American market to promote a software asset management blockchain-based solution. Now, disclaimer, I sit on the board of uh, advisors, so take that as it will, but I do mention this idea in my book that, and these folks are the first ones to actually come out with a solution. If anybody is interested, there's their contact information. So, in conclusion, software asset management and hardware asset management to a bit of a degree, um, our problem, and we don't have a good solution for them. We can do okay, but it's not best. Blockchain has the potential to resolve these underpinning concerns, especially around the trust between the three parties, around intellectual property, around usage, around cost overruns, and the double spend conundrum. So my recommendation is, I have seen the end of my industry, and it is blockchain. So, I think we've got some time. I don't think I've gone over. The clock just started and it says, oh, 40 seconds. So, uh, <laughs> if there are any questions, do we have a microphone or are you just gonna yell at me and I'll try to, ah, oh, we do have a microphone, very good. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Me? Yes. Um, your company, NeoCore? Yes. Who pays you? All three entities? Or advertising? Or how do you give, make money? I am not at liberty to say. <laughs> no, the idea is that it, um, it's the relationship between the corporate customers that sign on to the service and the software publishers that also sign on to the service. So the pitch is, if you will, that whatever you're paying the big four to run your audits, we do it in a third. And that's usually enough incentive, brings it back into the realm of a plain old ordinary cloud-based software as a service to then go ahead and use. Make sense? Good. Anyone else? Excellent. Well, so um, as part of your, uh, at uh, Internet 2.0, uh, I actually will be hosting a book signing. So for the first 50 people that come to the booth, uh, I'll be happy to give you a copy and sign it and answer any other questions that you might have. Um, let's see, and I think I had one more thing. Oh. Well, yeah, there's the question and answer. Sorry about that, folks. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, so I've got a question for you then. Um, how many people still have that theme song running around in their head? Best way to get rid of it? Hear the whole thing. And we all know what comes next, right? Woo! Yeah. So 
So the sound guys really appreciated this in the back. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.